Welcome to the Dentist News Network. Fewer than half of Americans see a dentist each year and millions live in areas where access to dental care is severely limited. That's according to new analysis from the Health Policy Group Institute of Medicine. Uh, a severe uh, shortage of dentists, especially those serving rural and minority groups, is contributing to the persistent and systemic barriers to oral health care. That's according to the report. Uh, my guest is Shelley Geshen. Uh, she is uh, the director of the Pew Children's Dental Campaign with the Pew Center on the States. Uh, Shelley, it's a pleasure. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Um, a lot of this information here isn't particularly new. We know that many people don't have dental coverage and the costs of dental care uh, continue to escalate, but this, but this study shows a real big gap in minorities and, and older Americans and, and kids particularly, doesn't it? It really does. Basically, the Institute of Medicine report concluded that the system we have works pretty well for about two-thirds of the population, but the other third are really left out in the cold. And um, what is the, the principal cause of this, do you think? You know, there are many causes, and you touched on one of them, which is that we have an inadequate financing structure, not enough people have dental coverage, there's not enough money in the system, but we also have the lowest ratio of dentists to population that we've had in 100 years, and very few dentists actually locate in rural areas or underserved areas of, of in cities and very few of them take, take patients that are insured by Medicaid or the state children's health insurance program. There's some pretty astonishing access gaps in this country, and we just haven't made enough, enough progress towards fixing them. Uh, some of the fascinating information here in this uh, is the study is regarding uh, minorities, uh, and it's, it's quoted here as, as I think you said that uh, most dentists are typically white men and the research shows that dental students from rural or underserved areas are more likely to go back to these areas to practice and and there is a a big gap here and that's just not happening that's true actually if the 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 percentage of dental students that are minorities has has held roughly steady but it's really really tiny um, there's more and more women who are becoming dentists just like more and more women have become physicians in recent years and that may have implications for access down the road because more of them practice part-time. But you're right. There are very few people who are become dentists who are come from rural or underserved areas. And, and, very, and, the, and if we had more, we could reasonably expect more of them to return to serve those areas. Uh, also, is, is it accurate to say, too, that a lot of dentists, a lot of professionals have a tough time treating people who are in Medicaid, for example, because the reimbursements are so low and it doesn't it just doesn't make good sense for them for some reason well that's right some people make it work no matter how low the rates are and that it's unclear why so more research is certainly needed into that um, in in medicine it's basically it's more common for the ethics of the profession to basically dictate that that physicians should take all patients and hospitals should take all patients regardless of ability to pay that ethical framework is not necessarily present or taught or reinforced in dental school, even though I'm sure that many dentists actually feel that way, and the rates certainly don't help. But one of the recommendations that the Institute of Medicine made was that the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services fund demonstration projects to basically figure out how to do a better job with public dollars in serving those who are left out of the system. Uh, the administrative process probably is, is <laughs> as these things tend to be, the bureaucracy is, is far too complicated, and, and sometimes that can be a contributing factor? That is definitely a factor, and one of our recommendations was that we really, the IOM really felt that in order to get the programs to work better for providers, the rates ought to be set in a more sensible way. There ought also, states should fund case management services, so that patients don't skip their appointments, which makes it difficult for dentists. And they also, states need to streamline their administrative processes so it's, it's easier to get paid for a claim and to file a claim and to become a Medicaid provider in the first place. 
Well, when you look at this information, talk about in, in your mind some ways that would, uh, you know, help boost access to dental care and maybe some new ways that would help deliver dental care, especially to those groups that we're discussing, uh, elderly, uh, children, uh, minorities. Well, the, the IOM report basically recommends that there be an array of providers and, that, and the system be changed so that there are more access points. So one of the innovative thoughts that we rec that we made is that the, the Health Resources and Services Administration really ought to develop a set of core competencies so that other types of health providers can do a limited amount of oral health care. Right now, physicians can do and pediatricians can do a preventive care and screening and oral health education for young children and, of course, educate their families. But there are also other kinds of providers who could help, like nursing home aides, um, nurses in general in other kinds of practices. I mean, there, there may be small roles that lots of different kinds of providers can take so that there's not such a big separation between oral health and general health. Another big thing that we need to move towards is using technology to support remote collaboration and supervision. You know, we're in 2011 now. It's, it, we have so many technologies that can link people. That can work to actually provide a, a link between a provider who, who is out in a rural area and their supervising dentist in a, in a totally different area. It's been demonstrated multiple times. It's safe. It works. There's no reason not to do it. Uh, there are some uh, good uh, suggestions here, I think, some from, from you. Uh, one in particular, uh, I, I didn't realize that 22 states still in the uh, U.S. still require a visit uh, to the dentist before a child sees a dental hygienist. And it seems like if someone could just get a kid in to see a hygienist and get their teeth you know, treated and clean on a regular basis, that would uh, solve a lot of problems. The IOM recommends that state legislatures look at their state dental practice acts and any other laws and make sure that they are evidence-based and that they allow dental pro professionals to practice to the full extent of their training. And uh, that you're, a very good example is that there is no evidence, actually let me say it positively, the evidence shows that a hygienist has the training to do a visual inspection and figure out whether or not it is safe and, and appropriate to apply a dental sealant in a public health program. And not, so that means that there's no reason for a dentist to examine a child first before they get a sealant in a public health program. And yet 22 states still require a dentist to see a child first. And no one is disputing that a child should see a dentist, but it shouldn't be a, a legal obstacle and a barrier to getting those cheap preventive services in a public health program. And yes, 22 states have these laws that are not evidence-based, and they're not, they don't make any sense. Another, another uh, aspect of the study is a dental workforce. Shelley, can you talk about that? Yes, I can. The IOM concluded that all the research shows that it is that there are no quality concerns or safety concerns about the for the care that new types of providers such as dental therapists provide. So the IOM recommended that that uh, states and research organizations and foundations go ahead and fund demonstration projects to test whether or not they can actually improve access. So that's an exciting new development. My guest has been Shelley Geshen. She is director of the Pew Children's Dental Campaign. And you're watching the Dennis News Network.